Hey folks, I want to give an introduction to ISOMAP, which is just one of many different nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques. Others include Laplacian eigenmaps, LOE or locally linear embeddings, self-organizing maps, um, multidimensional scaling, which actually appears as one step in the ISOMAP algorithm. So let me contrast ISOMAP with linear dimensionality reduction techniques, first of all, such as principal component analysis or PCA. So imagine this is your data set. It's the so-called uh, Swiss roll data set. And pretty much whenever you write a paper about nonlinear dimensionality reduction, you might include a Swiss roll as one of your canonical examples of a data set that you don't want to reduce the dimension linearly, but instead in a, in a nonlinear way. So linear dimensionality reduction methods, you should just think of as a projection of your data set down onto a, uh, a linear subspace, something like a plane or a line or a 3D subspace. So if I projected the switch roll down onto the purple plane, what would happen? Well, I would have some of these orange points collide with some of these teal points. And I would have some of these dark blue points collide in the plane with some of these light blue points. Okay. So I'm, I'm destroying some of the patterns in this data set if I just collapse the switch roll down to a plane, I just smush it on top of itself. The idea of nonlinear dimensionality reduction is you like to lay the switch roll flat, unroll the switch roll. Right, um, which re requires something nonlinear, right? You're unrolling something that's been rolled up. That's a very nonlinear operation. But it allows you to see the more inherent organization between the data points, right? We think these two red data points are close because they're you know, just in the same way they're close here. You know, and we think this data point is close here because it, it's close in the higher dim dimensional model. Other manifolds are harder to unroll, like a sphere or a torus is, is harder to unroll. So the Swiss roll is a very easy nonlinear data set to unroll down onto a lower dimensional picture. But nevertheless, you know, people um, try to reduce dimension for more complicated manifolds than, than just the Swiss roll. It allows you to see a map of your data set. You know, maybe you think of these as the true coordinates of how the data points are, are related to each other. Okay. So what are some of the nits, uh, nuts and bolts of isomath? The distance between this data point and this data point could be just thought of as the Euclidean distance. But the goal of isomap is instead to say, no, you know, I really want to measure that my space lives on, on some sort of role. And I really want to think of the distance between these two data points as this longer green curve. Okay. I would call I would call this blue dotted line right there as this is the Euclidean distance. Whereas this line, right, this curve right here, I would call this the geodesic distance. Now, if we had the entire Swiss roll there, okay, you could know how to move inside of the, that surface. We don't have the entire Swiss roll, we just have some data points. So, so what does it mean to have this continuous geodesic path when all I have is discrete data points sampled perhaps from the surface. In isomath, the way that you approximate this geodesic distance is you build a network, a graph on top of your data points. There's two common ways to do that. Either take each data point and connect it to each of its k nearest neighbors, where you pick some value of k, like maybe k is equal to five or seven. Or around each data point, you could draw a ball and then connect each data point by an edge 
all of the other data points within that ball. So if you choose those parameters appropriately, you won't have this edge in your data set. And now the shortest path between any two data points is just you know, the length or the number of edges you have to cross in this network reconstruction of your data set. Okay. So you know, this red path is not exactly the same as length as this continuous blue path, path but it's a really good approximation of the geodesic path between these two data points. It's pretty cool how ISOMAP does this. It's using the data set to then approximate the geodesic distance between any two data points in that data set. So if you have n data points, you get n to n choose two approximated geodesic distances. You could think of this as an n choose two distance matrix. Okay. Uh, it, sorry. <laughs> you should think of this as an n by n distance matrix. You have n data points, this, those same n data points, and each entry of this matrix tells you the distance between two points. Um, okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use something called multidimensional scaling, which is another dimensionality reduction technique to map this data set into lower dimensional space in a way that preserves these geodesic distances as best as possible. So we map the data points into say 2D instead of 3D where I started. And in general, it might be from 100 dimensional space down to 10 dimensional space. We map into lower dimensional space in a way that these distances the geodesic distances are as close as possible to the Euclidean distances in that lower dimensional space. And for this particular unrolling of the Swiss roll, we do a reasonable job. So I admit I haven't really explained that last step, but, uh, but we're using an algorithm that allows you to find the best embedding of a data set into lower dimensional space that can preserve whatever distances as well as possible. And here we're choosing to preserve these approximated geodesic distances. All right, let me end with one example. I wanna show ISOMAP applied to this data set of images of a statue. Okay. So our data set is very high dimensional, all these images. Um, and when we map down into two dimensional space, this is the um, particular picture that we get. One comment is that this data set doesn't look like a switch roll necessarily, but it looks like some high dimensional surface in an even higher dimensional space. Okay. And so we're sort of unrolling this data set to produce a 2D plane map. If you, if you look at these red circles, each red circle corresponds to one of these shown images. Okay. And the other data points are, are images that are not, not displayed. And you can sort of see some layout to this map. The images on the right side, the statue is looking to the right, whereas the images on the left side, the statue is looking to the left. And then the images at the top, the statue is mostly looking a little up, whereas the images at the bottom, the statue is mostly looking a little bit down. So we can interpret these relatively natural coordinates. The horizontal direction tells you, is the image looking to the right, or is the statue in the image looking to the left? And the vertical coordinates seem to tell you is this that the image in the statue looking up or mostly looking down. So we didn't program in for ISOMAP to find these coordinates. And we might have had to interpret things. You know, maybe ISOMAP gave us a map that was rotated in some sense. And, and then we rotated around to get a picture that, that we like the best. 
there's a um, another natural coordinate here, which might be the lighting orientation. So the lighting orientation of these images is actually shown by this knob on the bottom. So that tells you where's the light source coming from. You know, is the light source coming from this side of my face or from the other side of my face? Now, oops. Maybe if you did a higher dimensional isomath embedding, so maybe if you embedded into, into 3D space, maybe that lighting direction would be picked up by isomath. I, I forget if that's the case or not. I don't know off the top of my head. But do let me reinforce that we're not choosing, you know, we're not choosing what the coordinates we want to embed down onto are. No, we're, we're letting this algorithm embed things in the way they're optimal for the algorithm. And then after the fact, you might try to interpret the coordinates, which is not always obvious. Although in pretty data sets like this, there is a nice interpretation. Public questions? Thanks so much. Private questions. The thing I was wondering is, I mean, a sort of a natural way that it seems like this could go wrong would be if your like manifold, say your even a Swiss roll, is sort of wrapped too tightly relative to um, your the um, density of your data points. Are there versions of this that sort of try to be more robust by or try to like be robust resistant to sort of single linkages jumping across that like look at like the three shortest paths through the map. Um, mm -hmm. I guess there's probably lots. Uh, they try to like resist bridges, I guess. Yeah, Landers, Lander raises a great point. He's like, um, identified an obvious potential like flaw in this algorithm, which is um, it's hard to build such a good network like this. Okay. Realistically, your network, you know, is either gonna have a bunch of gaps, like a bunch of holes, or it's gonna have like connections that you don't want. So, um, Lander, I'm sure a lot of people have looked at this. I don't know. Um, too much specific to say off the top of my head, except I wanted to mention the heat kernel, which is the following idea. So let me zoom in here. Let's say of all these edges that are that are already drawn, right? So I have all of these edges. But then I add in a couple, a couple more. 